Hi, everybody, and welcome to the RHAP BNB for week three of Survivor 46. My name is Mike Bloom, and we are back to normal for Survivor 46, back to our usual 90 minute episodes. And as we're finding out, normal is a very variable term for Survivor 46, as we have a very odd week to talk about through of course i am not alone i am joined by my two arms on this podcast if you will we'll see how fully operational they are by the end of it first and foremost liana boris liana how are you i'm doing well thank you mike i'm knowing when to hold i'm knowing when to fold i've been studying up on all of that so i can't i don't know <laughs> how do you study you know you gotta know when to hold and you gotta know when to fold okay so like that's the key there mike all right. And when to walk Can you away. it again? No, yeah. well, listen, I think he discounted that after maybe the Jelinski stuff. That's why Banu left that mm -hmm. off of the phrase. Of course, we have a lot of Banu to get into. You just heard his wonderful voice. So happy to be joined. Once again, it's Big Brother Canada season, so I'm glad we were able to scoop him up right here at the start. It is the winner of Big Brother Canada season 10, Kevin Jacobs. Hi, I'm, I'm thrilled to be back at the b and I think Bonu was very upset to see himself in the presence of three masterminds, and I'm happy to be in the presence of three masterminds today. There we <laughs> go. Uh, which one of us is the the mermaid dragon of it? AKA, who is the human dragon? Because again, the upper <laughs> half of a mermaid, as people have pointed out, is just a person. Well, someone made an argument to me that mermaids actually do have lungs that are fish-like or gills on the top half, and I thought it was I thought it was a pretty good rebuttal. Yeah, actually, that's a really good point because we don't have an idea of the anatomy. So inside, you know, it could know. be completely different. I've looked at so, enough DB in order to know the anatomy. <laughs> um, well, look, I think that if you're going to describe a mermaid dragon, mm -hmm. what a weird combination of things. What a weird podcast. What a weird episode. Like there's just everything feels very simpatico. That's the thing is that, listen, there's going to be a lot of commentary and perhaps consternation about this episode being too much Banu. But the more Banu talked, I think the more we kind of got fed, even though Yanu isn't. Because I think Banu is like perfect B&B &B fodder to the point of that confessional where he talks about mermaid dragon. This man, extra wouldn't even be describing him. He's an entire freaking gum rack at the store, let alone a pack of extra at this point. And look, a lot of people, myself included, would say too much Banu for one episode. But I think that we are going to have plenty to talk about as I'm having difficulty, Kevin, describing as to whether Banu over the course of these 90 minutes had one sustained breakdown or several breakdowns mm. over the course of this period of two days. It's several. And the reason is because Literally, whenever there's seven, hope... Yeah. <laughs> Whenever there is hope, there's a moment where you're coming out of it. So he has a chance to mm. do the puzzle. Oh, he has a little bit of hope. And then he goes down again. And then he has a little bit of hope that he could stay. It's 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 unbelievable. But it was a series of breakdowns. It can't one one breakdown doesn't last that that long. Mm hmm. Well, yeah, speaking of not lasting long, uh, I don't think Banu is necessarily long for this world. So I know it's a lot of Banu in one episode, but I have a feeling like the majority of the season, there's not going to be much Banu there. So you know, let's know. take the intense dose. Yeah. You think, Kevin, are you trying to uh, manifest some hope as Jeff Probst is saying, maybe, you know, the God striking down Randon because he heard Banu's prayers was a way for Yanu to bounce back from this? Yeah, so first of all, God's obviously on Banu's side. He has him. He's prayed the whole episode. Second of all, one of the most scary things in Survivor is when you hit rock bottom. There is nothing for Banu to lose at this point. Like, he, he can't go wrong because he's already gone wrong so much. The only place to go is up. So I actually wouldn't be surprised to see him just doing something. I don't know what something is, but something. That's interesting. <laughs> it's almost akin to maybe I just have Amazing Race on the brain. But, like, you get so turned around. You get so lost that you hit a dead end. And you're like, all right, the only thing I can do is just turn around and see if I can make my way back to the road. And sometimes you do, but either way, you're going to do at least a little bit better because, yeah, this was... Every time we thought it couldn't go worse for Banu, it somehow did to the point of him having an emotional breakdown and the umpteenth moment of religious strife 
at like a craft table that had a bag of rocks on it as these two complete strangers kind of looked on and were like, you know, like Jack Donaghy with Liz Lemon, like with the broom. Oh, they're there. We don't know exactly what to say to you. So here's the thing. Uh, I'll be intrigued to get everyone's thoughts on this episode because, you know, I feel particularly inspired. I think last season when the announcement of 90 Minutes came about, I think a lot of people said, great. You know, it's tough to compare seasons now because I do think a lot of Survivor seasons, a lot of Survivor episodes would do better with more time. I'm happy there's an exception to the rule here, unfortunately, in episode three of Survivor 46. I was not a fan of this episode. And look, I think there's only so much they could do, not wanting to excuse them a lot, but given like the weird, unprecedented situation of Randon waking up and then getting medevac that later in the day and the suddenness of that, it's always tough to kind of structure that through. That being said, as much as I'm saying we are well supped on the Banu of it all, I did think, especially in the moment, this was too much Banu. Uh, this felt like euthanasia over the course of a 90-minute period, only for the governor to step in and be like, no, 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 this dog will live another day. And he gets spared in the end. I, I just think the editing has been so odd for me. And I'm trying to figure out how much of it is circumstance, how much of it is they had to do two hours last week. They did a 90-minute episode with one challenge and a weird medevac anticlimactically at the end of it. But I just feel like, especially comparing it to the secret scenes, there, there's literally so much left on the cutting room floor. As an example, there's a secret scene on Sega where everyone's basically like, I can't talk strategy with Ben. Ben's not playing. Ben refuses to talk game. Every time we ask him something, he's like, yeah, that rocks. Or he quotes some sort of random 80s hair metal band. I think not only does that give really valuable strategic insight into the tribe dynamics and Ben, I think it counters so nicely with what Ben, in my opinion, impressively did later on, which was like show, okay, maybe he does have a little bit of game to him when he's able to come back and do a really great job of lying about what happened on the journey. And so it's moments like that. And maybe it's because I'm exposed to these secret scenes. And by comparison, I'm like, like sort of what we talked about last week, Liana, with the Venus scenes. Like, I think we could have cut one Banu scene in favor of putting that Sega scene in there. Yeah, I think I think that's fair. I think overall, well, obviously, aside from the medivac, because I'm not no one likes to see a medivac, right? No one likes to see someone get pulled for the game for reasons outside of their they got voted out or they chose to leave. So for me, that was always very it's always going to be very disappointing. But I feel like overall, I liked last week's episode less. I feel like mm. last week's episode for me was way more boring than this episode because I I don't mind the overload of Banu. Mm. And part of that is because I disagree with Kevin. I don't think he is long for this world because I think that he's the type of person that even when you look and you're like, he's a disaster. He's my, he's the Philip, right? But there are very few people who can be Boston Rob. And I think getting your Philip to like stay focused and like stay on the mission is so more, so much more challenging. And I feel like at a certain point, you're just going to be like, I can't anymore. Like I, I just can't, we just have to let this person go. Um, so for me, I didn't mind so much. I do feel like this episode would have been better if Banu had ultimately been voted out because then it's all about him, right? It's all about his swan song. Let's get this wackadoo character, like give him his wackadoodle Liana, please. Gone. Quite, sorry, yes. I mean, wackadoodles can win, we heard, but haven't seen it quite yet. Uh, so, except for God, obviously, protecting Banu and all that. God, so, the ultimate you know, wackadoodle. The ultimate, yes, as we like to say. So, I don't know. I, I didn't, I wasn't bothered so much by it. I didn't mind the inundation of Banu, but I can also understand why it would be complete overload for a lot of people. Kevin, as someone who uh, foresees a longer future, a longer mermaid tail or dragon tail, if you will, for Banu, how did you feel about the edit of this episode? Well, here's the thing. We just had the Academy Awards, and I'm the type of person that I'm, I'm going to watch most of it. In a given year, I'm going to watch eight or nine out of ten Best Picture nominees, and I'm going to enjoy them because I've got a couple hours to devote to them. I'm really excited about it. But if you come to me and you say, oh, you know, this new show, Shogun on FX, is unbelievable. I'm going to say, that's great. Thank you so much. I'm going to stick to my competitive reality TV. That's not for me. And when I do that, I want to get a contained story. I want to sit down, see it. I don't want to be overwhelmed. I don't want to walk out of 
three hours of Oppenheimer being like, that was amazing. Let me take a year off before I even look at this thing again. I want to get the whole thing. So these two hour episodes, too much. Hour and a half, you know what? It's still a lot for me. However, what I will say, they're really, really doing well is I want to see something different. And this is not blending in with Survivor 41 to 45 for me. Mm. This feels like its own thing. And for that reason, I'm in. Give me an episode of Banu melting down. Give me all this unique stuff and these these villains versus villains versus weirdos. Like I am here for what this is. It is a little bit different. I think it takes a little bit of an open mind to, to go on the journey because this does not feel like your dad's survivor 43 no oh wow i don't know how old your dad is uh but uh pretty young dad i i completely agree and i this opinion has been echoed it has such an old school feeling to me which is so weird compared to sort of like obviously the new school elements that are brought in and i feel like we even got dashes of this last season with like okay katora doesn't like bruce nobody likes bruce jake and katora have this odd frenemy thing going on but like they are coming right out of the gate with this. What I find so interesting, though, is to n- talk about a bit of the commentary last week into this week. I don't think the show thinks these people are villains. Like, I think a lot of people looked at Tiffany and Kenzie and Q's actions last week. We even talked about it as like, OK, too much punching down, being too vindictive. But I feel like when we get edits of Kenzie being like, Banu is a lovely person, but he doesn't have a strategic bone in his body. That doesn't feel to me like, oh my God, they're saying such scathing things about Banu. That feels to me like her speaking honestly on behalf of the show, Uh, where Mm -hmm. I think that the way that I've heard Jeff kind of speak about people like Jelinski and Jess and now Banu is like him saying, yeah, they're having a tough time grasping the game. They're having difficulty doing so. And so I think it's almost less about, oh, these specific people are so mean high school insults etc i think it's more so the show kind of using them and look it's not like they're putting words in their mouth but i think they're sort of showcasing and we talked about this last week as well liana right like more of the edit punching down than outright like these people doing so to really showcase like yeah listen these people are certainly out of their elements in the elements and so that is sort of colored i think my rethinking of this quote unquote villain stuff that we're getting this season especially this episode when again we're going to get a lot of people reacting to banu i can understand i certainly have some sympathy for him like the frustration he must be experiencing but at the same time the way things were edited it made me feel like we had to kind of take the side of everybody but banu mhm i looked to the music cues to tell me what i should feel exactly. like exactly give Give me an indication of how I should be feeling in this moment. Like when we get the dodo music, I'm like, that's dumb, right? Because <laughs> it's like, do, 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 do. and I didn't get like the sinister music really for any part. Even last week, I would say also like I never got the, oh, this is the evil, like sort of sinister move. So I do agree with you that I don't think the show is really going out of their way to show these people necessarily as villains. I think it's more just like, what a hot mess. What a hot freaking mess. I feel like that is really what's being mainly communicated to me about Yanu. And here's the difference for me. It's not just Banu for me. It's everyone is fast. Like yeah. Q is looking out after after yes. losing this, thinking about when he fumbled in his high school football game. Uh, and they brought and- in the music. <laughs> Talk about music. Yes. He's like, remember where you were. <laughs> Why does my road have to be the hardest? That- yes is like to me that is like freaky and interesting and different and th- there's it's not just them the the entire nami tribe is is i don't know what is going on there it like Ugh. it's not just badu i think badu actually fits in with this cast in this weird unique quirky dragon mermaid type way totally agree i mean look at again the response to banu sinking to his knees being like they called me a fool and Ben responds with, that does not rock. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> In what world is that at all the most appropriate response to this man who you do not know? Having, like, if I was approached by someone on the street who was clearly in dire straits, I don't think I personally would respond with, that does not rock. And then Liz tries to, I think, take the middle ground of like, oh, that's so mean. Oh, how dare those mean people? 
And then it just leads to Banu giving an absolute, not even a Shaquilla, a one-man show about what life on Yanu has been for the first seven days. It, is he Leo? Is he Leonardo DiCaprio? Maybe. I don't, like, it's... Ben, ben, with his second Nick Cage reference of the season, is not even close to the most out-of-place thing in this yeah. episode. Yeah. No, you know what? Banu is Daniel Day-Lewis. Because look at the beginning of this episode, right? When, like, Q and Tiffany are like, you can lie to Jeff. And Banu's like, I physically cannot. He is one of the most method actors, right? Like, this is his truth. He is living in his truth. He cannot be anybody else in this moment, even if that means not just opening up every single part of him at tribal council. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I feel about this season so far is that it just seems to be coming across as pure comedy. Like that's more what I'm getting out of this. Like, especially to go back to the Q scene where he's like, I can't believe, you know, like I, I, my road's the hardest or whatever that line, but also the fact that, that we get Hunter's puzzle dungeon. And then we fast forward to Q being like, but he didn't practice either. <laughs> like that juxtaposition with the setup of the, of all of Hunter's puzzles that he clearly has prepared for, sure. Maybe not the beanbag up on the platform, but like he's obviously very, very, very prepared. Like even that is just so funny. And I love that they're giving us those types of things because they didn't necessarily have to show that Hunter stuff in this episode. They actively chose to do it. And I love that. Oh my God. We, we have to talk about that because- First off, I do love the Jeffrey Dahmer layer. And I say that with love for Hunter. That is like, you're going to complete the tree puzzle one more time. And then I'll let you go of like, welcome to my den. Uh, that would make John Kierhofer scoff. I mean, what's interesting though, is like how that came about. I mean, these are obviously things that he makes with like a jigsaw at home out of wood. And then, yeah, it sort of translates to the, the challenge win, but not completely. I think by far the most impressive thing he does is what he does over that barrel, right? Which is just not even mm. challenge practice. That's pure physics, baby. Yes. I was like, I told you, I was like, that's why he's a science teacher. I was like, physics, physics, physics. <laughs> I loved that when he just like grabbed onto Tevin. And I love the, also the inclusion of like, okay, Tevin, get ready <laughs> before he just Here like comes Hunter. <laughs> yeeted over the thing so good so good and then and then venus is talking about how there's one guy like this every season and it's almost for a second oh should we should we be disliking hunter and it's like, oh this this guy's unbelievable he, he got a full he got a full ride to med school she decided to be a science teacher instead at high school and he just loved it in his hometown it's like oh i i get it i get and it he, and he over. built a bed you know. which uh <laughs> honestly could have helped somebody on his tribe in retrospect unless yeah. do you think randon slept on the bed and that was the problem i wasn't sure how like the i don't want to call them springs obviously they're not springs but like the lattice thing that he had built kind of mm -hmm. in the middle i don't know i did that didn't feel like super super supportive but maybe he just didn't like fully test it yet because when he first pushed down on it it felt like all the little sides were kind of popping down but yeah but soda soda said that's a bed sound which like i'm intrigued by that sentence talk about high comedy i i kind of wanted to stop down during our 90 minutes and be like soda can you talk to me more i feel like jeff soda you mentioned a bed sound how does that compare to the game of survivor yeah it's like a squeaky yeah. like a squeak like a bed squeak <laughs> Yeah, that's why he wanted to call them springs, <laughs> even though they weren't. I well, thought it looked comfortable. I, I mean, it looks, yeah. I think, a lot com more comfortable than the bamboo. I think it almost bamboo, seems like, yeah. to your point about the, you know, support, it felt almost like a hammock, just with hard sides to it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, the way it was woven seems like it's the like way a, you do it. Like they a just, cot. Exactly. Like, like they yeah. just used the rope, I think, from their fishing gear. I mean, we talk about waking up on the wrong side of the bed. Let's talk about somebody who unfortunately had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day in Randon here because there was also obviously a lot of scuttlebutt as to how this happened, why this happened, perhaps bringing in some more logistical elements as was presented in the moment of like, okay, Randon, we got to pull you to get this MRI cut to him in his final words being like, hello, everybody, I'm just fine. We found out after the fact that was not necessarily, uh, you know, a next day type of thing. But Kevin, give me your reaction, in, in, especially from like a storytelling perspective as to how this kind of got seeded in. I mean, when whenever you see Dr. Will showing up, it's it's indicative that it's important to the story. So I, I was worried as soon as he was there. 
it feels like from a storytelling perspective, this is part of Venus's story. There's something going on with her. We've seen her in every episode. Randon was her only real ally, and it seems like him leaving is almost a, another sort of notch in her journey that she has to overcome. That's how I read it. I also would have liked to see this is weeks later on the after credits, because I was like, bring him back. Bring him back. Take him for them. All right. Don't let him talk to anyone and bring him back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they could, pulled, they could have pulled a Christmas. He doesn't even need to cast his vote <laughs> within the hospital room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I um obviously yeah, I didn't know also cuz the way that they prop the okay, the way that they have him sitting is like he's at Ponderosa giving a confessional. Day so after. they even made it seem like this was the next day. Like it wasn't like him from his house. It was like clearly him, I don't know where he was when they filmed this, like what exactly the setup was, but what what it was made to look like was he was at Ponderosa. Yeah. So uh, this has obviously brought about a lot of discussion as to specifically whether or not they should institute the rule that's been used in Australian Survivor as of late, which is essentially like a 24-hour grace period, where if someone needs to be evaluated outside of like Dr. Will stopping by for a checkup, they can pull them from the game temporarily, give them an evaluation. If they feel like the treatment will suffice, they'll return them back into the game and carry on hunky-dory. We've seen this a couple times. It sort of has varied. Sometimes people have come back. Sometimes people have been medevac. Sometimes people have missed tribal councils. Sometimes people were taken and brought back and should not have been brought back. Uh, the first time this was used on Australian Survivor, someone got put back in the game who had an ectopic pregnancy, which was not a good mm. thing to do. Uh, and the weird thing is that obviously, again, for those that don't know, uh, Randon has said to myself, to Rob, to a bunch of others, that actually it took him days, if not weeks, to basically get his hand and arm fully operational. Again, this was not like a pinch nerve will heal in due time. He even said that like if he was left in the game, it was sort of like a Matthew-esque when not if that he wouldn't be able mm. to continue anymore. The show did not do itself any favors, certainly, by, again, presenting it in an order that made it seem like Randon got a fresh shower after his MRI and sat down for a confessional. Is like, oh yeah, my arm feels better already. Oh, uh, looks like all I needed mm-hmm. was was an IV in me. I do think, and look, it is asking a lot of this fan base to not jump to conclusions. But it's been no. so interesting to me. How dare you? I know. Uh, and audacious in the new era to see. So we've had three really weird metavacs with kind of questionable storytelling around it in the new era in even number seed is ironically enough which is jackson which is bruce and which is randon and i feel like every time the fan base immediately jumps out to be like f production what are they doing with jackson it was the case of like they only brought him on because of his storyline knowing they were gonna pull him on day two with Bruce, it was, oh, no, his head was just feeling a little sore. Pull him out of the game. This is when they brought in the 24-hour uh, mentions of the rule of, like, clearly just stitch him up a little bit, give him, him some water, and he'll be fine. Obviously, with Randon, we've just experienced this as well. Every single time in the content that's come out after their boots, they have all said, like, nope, that's not what happened. Uh, with Jackson, it was the fact that he had purposely not brought uh, disclosed his dependence on lithium until it was too late kind of forcing production's head with bruce dude had a whole ass concussion and with rain in here it took hours and weeks upon treatment again i will say that the show is not doing itself any favors by editing it the way that it does to kind of like minimize i think the severity of these injuries on the other hand survivor is not gray's anatomy and so i personally am someone to sort of say like when these odd circumstances happen, let's give it a little bit of time, hear from the perspectives of the eliminated player themselves to like highlight how bad things were for them, actually, rather than immediately jump out to be like, well, the show was wrong for doing this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you want the full story, right? I do think that there should be some responsibility of the show, though. Like, I don't really have an issue with either 
Like, I don't think that the show poorly handled the other two examples that you gave. I do think in this circumstance, there should have been something that was like, either don't even have him do the confessional, just put up a title card that's like, Brandon was able to see treatment after months, he recovered, whatever. <laughs> like, I don't know, something that just indicates that it wasn't just a willy nilly thing and like he mm -hmm. ended up being okay. So for me, or or like what Kevin suggested, which is put at the bottom, like several weeks later or something yeah. like that, I've been able to recover. Because well, something that you just, the way that they did it made it feel like, oh yeah, he's fine. Like, but like not even, but it was like, oh, he, he was like fine right after. So that's the only, that was the only like little teeny tiny, like little thing that I would say, but otherwise like whatever the yeah. grand scheme of things, we have more mermaids and dragons. Those are more important to me than, than that. I mean, they, they already had made way for the most generic lower thirds we had seen with four days earlier. Couldn't they just do like four weeks later in the lower third? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Exactly. It would have made a difference. There's also, there's also a little bit of an advantage to coming back and I'm, I'm a fan of it. If, if, you know, 24 hours, you leave and you come back. There is something to like the Tyson of it all and having an injury or, or even like a, like a Missy when she broke her foot or whatever. There's, there's something to being injured in the game, especially in the merge. It kind of makes you less of a target. So I'm a fan of it, but I also recognize that if you're good at the game, maybe you use that thing. Mm, that That is interesting. I don't, do you think that works in the new era small tribe season though? Cause I think Tyson certainly helps when he comes in with a reputation and he's in a tribe of like nine, eight people, a little tougher on these six person tribes where like if the, though also if Brandon comes back into the game and they lose, he basically has an idol so he can just use it anyway. Uh -huh. You got to time it. You got to time the injury for early merge. <laughs> Okay, you hear that, <laughs> Survivor fans? When you're out there, be sure to time your injury mm -hmm. just right. <laughs> Intentionally injure yourself at that point. Yeah. Like in a challenge, just run into something. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, what's the optimal intentional injury? Not not feet. You want you want like a like a shoulder or arm wrist situation. Arm thing. I Because I, I don't think you want anything head related no, 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 because... No concussion that's going to get you pulled i think yeah some kind of arm laceration or like shoulder dislocation i think is torn good biceps oh there we Ow. go <laughs> well i mean like you're not actually tearing your bicep i think you'd just be like oh god no oh, oh i pulled the muscle pulling a muscle not a thing. I feel like I, that, that feels a that. little too weak sauce. I think on the spectrum of things, like I don't think they're going to be like, "Well, so and so woke up with a Charlie horse. We got to keep him around to the end game." <laughs> he's a, he's a little booboo. -boo. Yeah, oh, a little booboo. -boo. Just oh, just kiss it, make it better. Yeah, a cramped, a cramp. That's probably not. You're just like, just drink more water. You know. Well, I think it's, not... it's less so about simulating injury. Could it be more so about, especially if the it's the early merge? Could you simulate illness? Could you do the old like Ferris Bueller and like, I don't know, smush up a bunch of coconut and like throw it at the side of the shelter and mm. be like, oh, I just heaved my guts out. I just hurled. Oh, no. Oh, I'm not feeling too good. Sure. I'd vote you out if you were sick. <laughs> really? I'd be like, I don't want any illness near me. Ew. Wear a mask and go quarantine at another side of the beach. I don't want, to, I don't want you near me. <laughs> Wow, that's a. Would you like stop the game basically to be like, no, 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 let's put down our weapons. This person's <laughs> hurling on the side of the shelter, putting us all in danger. A pulled muscle is not contagious, Mike. Okay, I'm I'm out for number one, me. <laughs> so I don't want to get sick. But if you pull a muscle, like fine, whatever. Like you're not gonna give me that pulled muscle. Actually, you're out for number one, not for number two, which you might be doing if you get this communicable disease oh, that I'm spreading around exactly. the camp. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm a number one girl, not a number two. All right. Well, let's see if Randon went number one, number two, Aww. or number 17. I'm not sure in the preseason predictions that Liana and I wrote out. I'm intrigued here because Randon was somebody who outright told me days before playing, like, listen, I don't know how I'm going to do. Uh, Liana, did you take him for his word here? Or did you have higher hopes for him? I was so mad at him. I'm and I'm still mad at him for being so down on himself. I mean, I look, I think he was probably in a bit of a better position. I think Nami continuing to win like helps him out. I think that that's great. Um, although in my preseason predictions, they were very soured by what he was saying in the preseason. So I did have him as pre jury, mm -hmm. and I was very inspired by what he said in the preseason. I said, Randon is a classic example of manifestation, him, his family. They all thought that he would struggle with social relationships, and guess what? He did. Hashtag power of positive thinking. 
Brandon failed to connect with the other tribe members, was left out of the power group of Tevin, Soda, and Liz, who felt they had enough strength with Hunter so they could afford to lose Randon. I said that Randon would look for an idol every chance he gets because, again, he manifested bad social relationships, but he couldn't find anything, plays his shot in the dark. It does not work. Then I just have a bullet point that says, I am sad. And then um, I said, oh, I, that's not in context. Anymore. Is that like, so did you take ape something that? from your personal diary? <laughs> well, I think, like, personally, I was just so excited for him. And I was mad about it. And I was mad that in my head, he was going to go free jury in this fantasy that I had made up. So yeah, I am sad. Um, and then instead of I sad, I am sad. His ally was Hunter. His enemy was Tevin, Soda, and Liz. Kevin, as someone who, you know, has traipsed these reality TV boards before, does pre-season attitude kind of matter here? Are you supposed to come in with sort of like that sense of ego that we always discuss of like, oh, no, I've got this. I'm going to take the game, considering what Jeff tells them in those first few seconds of the season as to like the vast majority of you are not going to. I don't think your your preseason attitude matters that much. And this is this is I just it's very easy to say I'm going to do well or I'm not going to do well. And I think a part of it is also a little a little showy for the preseason stuff. I actually don't think that it has much of an effect until once you hit the beach, it's done. Well, I had loftier goals for Randon. I, listen, I actually, I will, I will remove any sort of like responsibility I had because, again, I let the randomness, the randomness, if you will, mm -hmm. decide the outcome for me. And Randon made it to the jury in my universe, so perhaps I am less sad than Liana. But uh, I did say, as predicted, Randon will have a difficult time warming up to the extremely extroverted <laughs> Nami tribe. Luckily. He's able to get by in the first vote over Venus due to his perceived strength. I said that feeling his days are numbered, Randon hits the jungle and finds his tribe's idol, which will involve him conducting a mission at night and will get reference to his military experience from that. Um, despite connecting with Liz as a parent, he'll use his idol to take her out after an argument at camp over her work ethic boils over and he'll make it to the merge. But at a certain point, Randon remembers what he told me that a Tika 3 cannot happen this season. And so he begins to look elsewhere, making a counter-alliance to take out his fellow Namis. His plan is spoiled by the person he clocked all the way back from Ponderosa, Maria. She sells him down the river to the other Namis, who decide to blindside him at the final seven with an idol in his pocket. I also had his closest ally be Hunter. His enemy was Venus, then Liz, then Maria. <laughs> series of enemies yeah i mean listen Randon was someone uh, again i took him at face value to your point liana like not even the mm -hmm. i'm not gonna do well him specifically espousing like yeah i'm kind of a tough nut to crack i'm not the person to to bring milk and cookies to people and so i felt like that was gonna like portend some some conflict from him mm -hmm. ironically enough Randon was probably one of the least conflict heavy people in this season so far it was it was so normal yeah like, yeah just, the sole exception was like the poverty lights up. He's confirmed that now as like, oh no, that was actually a ploy that he was doing. It was bait for soda. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I mean, that's it. And we don't, we never really got a good idea of where he actually fell when it came to the tribe dynamics because they never went. So we're just sort of going off of everything through Venus's lens. And we don't know if that is a hundred percent accurate because the story of Nami is really being told through her. Yeah. And yeah, I'm just trying to think. I agree. I think he would have definitely been safe at that first tribal council. I think it would have been probably Venus or if Randon and Venus were somehow able to get the numbers together, like maybe a soda, maybe mm -hmm. a Liz. But I think Randon, I mean, he told me in a complete like mirror of his preseason perception of himself. He's like, I would have made the merge. I was making the merge no matter what. Honestly, I kind of believe him. If we're assuming that we're merging at like 12 or 13, he's either halfway there or almost or over halfway there at this point. Mm -hmm. So all he needs to do is either Nami wins a couple challenges or like he has that buffer of a Venus vote. If he wants to keep Venus around, he can play an idol on her. Uh, and so I, I think it's something that was possible. Kevin, what do you what do you think? As someone who felt that long outcome for Banu, are you thinking the same thing would happen for uh, for Brandon here. I actually think you, yeah, you would have had a good run. I think you would have been an early merge 
Boop because he's normal and put together and like seems to be more down to earth than, than a lot of the rest of the cast. But he seemed to be in a really good position and had a good head on his shoulders. Like he was thinking about things. He seemed to be the more active one in recruiting Venus versus her going to him. Like I, I feel bad. He he could have he could have made a little bit of a run. Do we think he should return? The doors that Bruce has opened and promptly bonked his head on the frame of. Do you feel like Randon should come back, Liana, for 47 or beyond? It's so tough. I mean, I I would love for people to get a second opportunity. I think someone who the conversation, like that they're not, it wasn't more of a conversation about was Matthew. Because I feel like there were a lot of people that were really high on him and feel like his story didn't get to fully play out. And I almost feel like I have more blue balls for Matthew than I do for Randon. But maybe that's just because we never got to see like the more complex dynamics over on Nami. Oh, is, so that, is that an injury you could fake in the early merge? Blue balls. <laughs> Yeah, I don't I personally I don't know about that. Um uh, maybe you two could speak more on that, but uh but I think if I were like ranking the people that I would want to see back, I think I would put Matthew above Randon, which is like no offense to Randon, more just I think the what we got to see, I feel more intrigued in what Matthew would do. Yeah, he was out he was out digging and putting fake idols there exactly. and setting traps for Jamie for sure. Yeah, I I'm just thinking to like Dr. Will, I gotta talk to you. I'm so freaking horny. I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> you get medivac for blue balls. Is that I, a thing? I, I think you just get kicked off the show at that point. <laughs> like, say, do not yeah. pass go. Do not collect a bunch of dollars. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, Kevin, yeah. you are giving away the Oscar gold here. Uh, which one of us between Liana and myself do you think had the more accurate breakdown of how Randon broke down in this game? Well, Mike, I actually think you had a really good yeah. breakdown of what would have happened if Brandon <laughs> stayed. If excuse me, Brandon stayed. Like I, I that that sounds like what would have happened. Yeah. Liotta, you had what actually happened. He went he went pre-merge. You both had him finding the the advantage. And Mike, as much as I want to give it to you, my eyes see Boris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do we think that the name Brandon or anything associated needs to be retired on Survivor, like a soft retirement, considering that it's kind of a cursed name? The person who we've had four Brandons in the past three seasons, and the furthest someone has made it is 11th place, uh, has been Oof. the first member mm. of the jury. Oh, no, sorry, 10th place. Sorry, I forgot about Matt Blankenship. So it's a little tough. So we had Brandon Cottom in season 44, even though. Arguably, if he didn't have that idol, he would have been voted out first. All the other Brandons, Randons, Brandos, no matter which way you squeeze <laughs> it, all went pre-merge. Yeah. Should you legally change your name then if you're a Brandon and you're going on Survivor or something close to that? You should cha legally change it before just in case for the curse. I feel like also the M name curse, we've heard mm -hmm. that one as well. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Change your name to something, I don't know. I guess as long as it doesn't start with an M... As long as it's not Brandon, Randon, something like that, then maybe you'll be okay. Do we, really? Any other curses? What other curses? Well, I mean, like, the last name has sort of manifested itself between Voce and Jelinski mm. a little bit. Because that's the thing. You don't need to necessarily don't change your name. You could be like when uh, people try to register themselves with SAG, and there's like, oh, well, there's already a Michael Jordan, so I'll be Michael ah. B. Jordan. Could you, like, go by your middle name instead? Yeah, I think that that's fair. Well, I think if you're a Brandon... The, the bar is low. Go for it. Like, its oh. expectations aren't going to be too high for you. Do your thing. Oh, that's yeah, interesting. And... Yeah, could you manifest of like, listen, I'm gone pre-jury anyway. My name mm -hmm. is Brandon. Just keep me around. I'm not going to win. Yeah. See? Power of positive thinking. <laughs> Just manifest that Brandon's always do poorly and you'll be fine. I, I can't move on without talking a bit more about this journey because there's so many things contained within here i mean kevin once upon a time you were given a mission to throw yourself at the feet quite literally of other people to claim that listen i can't do this anymore i'm going through some difficulties so like how did you see banu in this moment especially when he does exactly what yanu predicts when they see that he was picked for the journey of like not only making things worse for himself, but also making things worse for everybody around him in the process. So if we're talking about, you know, singing like a canary and Tiff's like, I don't know what he's going to say. The payoff was there. 
we we she said exactly what's gonna happen and then mm-hmm. he did exactly that and it was incredible to watch i mean it's it's the combination of him doing that uh ben and liz's reactions and also like the difference between liz getting the white rock being like, okay you know like and even even ben ben had the exact same experience at the puzzle he didn't get it he goes this does not rock and then he is a confessional where he's like it's an opportunity for me i'm gonna try to use this and badu is like the the sand hasn't even gone down yet the hourglass isn't empty and he's like it's over for me (laughs) i thought he was gonna pull a mini jelinski and like smash that hourglass be like i'm done i can't do this anymore How do you not like this? How how do you not be one of the million hearts that he wins over here? I know. I was half expecting him to like uh, just bolt into the jungle. Like I don't know why, but like that was a kind of like very intense energy that I was expecting. Just he's having a mental breakdown, and all of a sudden he just like takes off, and the cameraman's like following him into the jungle, and then they're trying to get a confessional. He's like having a breakdown, and there's like some crazy stuff going on. Like that's what I was expecting to happen. It was just so. It was so intense. It was so weird. It was wonderful. I loved it. And you know what? You know what was made even better? Most people would be at that journey being like, I want to get one of the rocks that gives me a chance to yeah. go or yeah. an advantage. He's like, I need this I'm white like, rock. No, I just I need let my Let me go, please. I don't want to be here. And then he ends up getting, again, the worst case scenario where he draws this rock, where he kind of walks into that play with this like almost self-defeatist attitude of like, I don't even want to be here anyway. Now I got to do this thing. And it makes sense, honestly, in retrospect, because like people say that, you know, usually I feel like, I haven't run the statistics on it, but I do feel like if you're facing with somebody who doesn't have a vote at a tribal council, like there's a good reason to vote him off because it's like your vote is your power. What Mm -hmm. good are you? And especially with Banu, like he could have made something work. He's in a tribe Mm -hmm. before he could tie the votes up with Mm -hmm. Q, but otherwise now he's coming back in a situation where he basically has to convince Tiffany and Q to keep him, uh, which as Mm -hmm. we saw by this episode is much easier said than done. I guess could Banu have traded the rock? Could he have convinced Liz, like, hey, I know we wanted to do this random draw. What if we just dump all the rocks out and you purposely give me the white rock and you two take this on yourself? Don't you want an advantage? Well, I was wondering with, I mean, if I'm if I'm even just Ben and him and, and we're about to go, it seemed like they couldn't really communicate. I'd almost just be like, do you just, do you just, if it was some sort of risk reward situation, do you just want it? Like, you don't know what you're facing. It's almost like, right. Let's give this dude the, the chance. I don't know. Or whatever he wants. White rock, blue rock. Like, please. I doubt they would have them. I, I had the exact same thought. Um, first with like, can you just give Liz the blue rock? Like, is there any rule? Like, what are the rules here? I just didn't quite understand the rules. And I also thought that it was going to be some kind of competition against each other. Right. So then I thought, oh, maybe there can be some negotiation or yeah, it is some kind of risk reward or something. I didn't think that it was just, okay, yeah, sorry. The unlucky person just doesn't even get to compete. And then the other two go yeah. do just a separate puzzle separately. Like, that's, Which I thought was kind of lame in and of itself. That's that, that's another thing that I think kind of like dragged down a bit of this episode for me. It was like the journey was pretty lame. Uh, I mean, look, the puzzle was difficult and it led to some interesting stuff with Ben moving forward. And it did lead to Banu walking home with his backpack on like he's a first grader who had a tough day at school. And everyone's like, oh, what's going on, buddy? Oh but at the same time, uh, honestly, I think we missed a prime opportunity to not bring back the card game. Could you imagine Ben, Liz, and Banu in the card game? If we thought Jelinski was as, was going to be like a huge fail on this thing, imagine Banu. But also, the inverse of that is what Jelinski claims of like, no, I was trying to seed, you know, goodwill with these other two tribes. Theoretically, that could happen in this case, where Banu's like, please, please. I need the extra vote right now. And like, they could have theoretically given it to him purposely failed the game or purposely said like, Oh yeah, Banu, you have the voter card. Okay. I believe you. Oh no, we failed the game. And they could have possibly allowed him to stay if they had given him an extra vote. For maximum TV interest. 
I'm trying to decide what role do I want Banu to have? Because I almost feel like, yes, it would be fun to try to see him lie, but him trying to decide between <laughs> Liz and Ben, another breakdown. Like, add that to the list. of. And all he would have gone that wrong. Yes, Andy probably. Even if they were giving it to him. <laughs> yeah, like yes, Ben would have yes. said, dude, I'm not I'm lying to you here. Gosh. I yes. got this. This car does rock. And I was like, okay. I, I can't go with you, though, in this moment. I must go with Liz. And Liz is like, he just told you what the card is. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I would have loved that. It would have been so good. I mean, him freaking out at the puzzle was funny, but that would have been better, I think. Yeah, I think I think there was some lost potential here. And I, again, I, I do think, like, the going off in directions complete a puzzle. I think there's been some back and forth as to, like, are these journeys starting to wear a bit thin? As weird as the card game was, I liked that to Kevin's point about like the tone of the season, it felt different. This kind of felt like defaulting back to what we usually do, but with also kind of the unnecessary wrinkle of like, well, all three of you aren't even going to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. that was weird. They seem to be making them like exceptionally hard. Like it did not look like an easy puzzle. I remember, I think it was like Brando or someone had one of these where they had to like um i'm messing this up they had to run a rope through this thing like these yeah, are not so, easy to loops do. Or yeah so, so that was the the savvy puzzle that they failed right. and then yeah, emily yeah. was challenged to do it on her own and she's like no doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and that's the other um, thing as well it's, it's a little bit again 44-esque in that like they were not given the choice to forego the challenge right mm -hmm. they couldn't have stepped up seen what the puzzle is and be like no i value my vote like it's odd to say that Banu got screwed here because, again, there was so much of this hole that he dug for himself. At the same time, I think the show did kind of dig a little bit more in that hole for him because it's like he was the one that was picked for the journey. He's He lost the challenge, so he didn't even get a choice in that. He had to pick randomly out of a bag and was guaranteed to play that game 66% of the time, in which case he almost always loses and loses his vote in the process. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, one other Banu moment that's sort of unrelated to the journey. But when he was looking for an idol and instead of like looking under leaves or in trees, he just turned over every coconut he could find. Like it was somehow going to be like very perfectly perched, like over under a coconut. That also very much made me laugh. And I would be remiss if I did not mention it. Yeah, it is very fun to see like Banu try to put so much energy and effort to it. But like the things we've seen of him so far is him just like, concerning his eyes back and forth as he's searching the jungle in the premiere and hear what he's like surely it must be buried one inch under this coconut so let me turn <laughs> yeah, like over not, a few things not even under the oh. leaves just the coconuts he's just knocking the coconuts over it's so funny i mean again such a an odd ending for an odd episode of an odd season when jeff comes to camp and like he doesn't end the episode on okay Randon, we're so sorry to have you go you know even like Randon's uh Randon's sort of to your point about everything being told through Venus, Randon's sentiments are kind of cut short by Venus, who was like, Man, this sucks. That's the last we hear from Nami in the episode. And then it cuts to Yadu that's like, Hooray, this man can't feel his arm. This is our Super Bowl. He wasn't thrilled about it. <laughs> it's because his road's the hardest. So he was ready to <laughs> to have to go to tribal. And I also, just... Tiff, Tiff and, and Padu seem to be having a really good... I wanted to see the end of that conversation. Like, Jeff, Jeff, take like two minutes, Jeff. Take like uh, three. Can I say low-key? I think Tiffany is my favorite character this season. I think her confessionals are so funny. We talked about the, the, the highest road coming from Q. Cut to Tiffany being like, dude, you're putting too much on yourself. Everyone's putting too much on you. Like, you could call yourself coach. I'm going to call you Benjamin. Uh, and then when Jan, the moment I clocked, it was so odd was everyone responding to Banu is one of my favorite parts of the season. We talked about, Oh, that does not rock. But when mm -hmm. Banu walks back to camp, like sad sack, Charlie Brown headed, he says, what happened? Tiffany goes, damn daddy. <laughs> She's like such a weird thing. And then to your point. Yeah. When her and Banu were having this conversation, I think she's trying to tease to him. Like, Oh no, don't worry. Probably convincing him not to play a shot in the dark, right? Of like, oh, I'm I'm undecided. And then Jeff just sort of like saunters into camp and she's just like, What the hell are you doing here? I, again, I think she is low-key one of my favorite confessionalists. And I do love her just sort of I feel bad that she is on just this 
absolute downward spiral of a tribe, but it does lead to her having some fantastic mm-hmm. reactions to it all. And she, she's a very like natural confessionalist. Like sometimes she'll be talking and she'll work through a thought, but it's still entertaining to watch, which is hard sometimes for people. Like she's like, yeah. everybody on the tribe just follows cute. Well, except me. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, I, and I also love that as well, that, that Jeff just kind of, like, sneaks up on them in the middle of camp, no sort of pop and circumstance, but, like, where did he come from? Because I visited that that camp, like, <laughs> there's the beach, and the camp is pretty much there. Like, mm-hmm. did Jeff come in from the other direction? Did he want to get the jump he, on He, like, him? military crawled into the jungle. Yeah, he's, like, sneaking up on him. He's wearing, like, the ghillie suit, dressed mm. up in all these leaves and branches. Yeah, because he did. He came from back in the forest. Like that's what it looked like, like from the jungle, like not from the beach. So I don't know. Yeah, I think they wanted to really espouse this idea of like he is the monster, right? Like he is part of the scenery at this point. And so like yeah. you never see him eat, you never see mm-hmm. him drink, you never see him go to the bathroom. Like he is this kind of immortal god of the season, and that includes him just appearing out of nowhere. Do you want to see Jeff go to the bathroom? Is that what? Let's move into our game for this week. Uh, so, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Speaking of Jeff Probst, I did get a gift. So, um, Puya got me a birthday gift, and I forgot to mention at the top of the show. So, this is my this is my gift. Oh, cool. my God. That's great. Now, Happy describe, birthday. describe to the uh, unfortunate audio only listeners what it, shirt you're wearing. How do you describe this? Um, it's like a Jeff Probst fan cam t shirt. <laughs> I guess is maybe like the best way I can think to describe it. There's a lot of Jeffs. It says Jeff Probst. There's a lot of Jeffs. Which one's your favorite? I like that one. Really? Okay. He's that- smiling. He just looks so happy. Look how happy he is. He does look this very This one's at- funny though because he's that one's cool. I was going to say, I think that's my favorite. It's like the Uncle Sam you point. He's yeah. like doing the Mona Lisa. Like you can't escape him there. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, all right. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Well, let's move into our game for this week. And it does feature Jeff Probst. And that is an unfortunate ceremony that Jeff Probst has had to perform a number of times throughout Survivor history. I do not mean to make light of situations that befall nearly 20 contestants over the past 46 seasons. But look, it is March And we had a very surprise medical evacuation in this most recent episode. I found it only appropriate that we do a medevacet. A bracket, a tournament of some of the most infamous medevacs in Survivor history. And by the end of this, I think we can determine with whatever criteria we want to use, what is the quote-unquote best medevac in Survivor Mm. history so far. Yeah, this is a, <laughs> I love the medivacket. Is that what you called it? I think it's got great branding, um, but I completely agree with Mike. This is like not to make light of the situation. Nope. I mean, certainly nope. with any medical evacuation, like it always breaks my heart, like for Randon, even though Jeff described it as a nerve situation, um, which is not like maybe the most serious way of describing Again, something. This production could have done a better job of really breaking down what was happening there. <laughs> yeah. Well, some of them you can make light out of. I mean, <laughs> well, when we go through the bracket, we'll see. <laughs> and, and that's the thing I think with this, some 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 medevacs are are, are horribly scary and and intense and to watch, and others, you know, we'll we'll talk about it. And the good news is that everyone who left the show under these auspicious circumstances has made a full recovery mm. since. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think they'll do like the full random thing. We didn't have Bruce Cannon guy wave his butt in the air and be like, I can poop now. But everyone was able to be the lead quote unquote, normal lives. I'm after this. Did. Uh, no survivor players were harmed in the making of this show. And so mm-hmm. we are going to make our way through. I got uh, from down to 19 down to 12. We are not going to be doing a tournament uh. of every single one. Just because uh, there were a lot of like, so-and-so got a hole in their body and there was an infection. And so they pulled them from the game, which like, to be honest, listen, getting pulled from the game for this reason is always interesting, but this is probably the most boring version of a medevac, right? They cut Uh, Neil Gottlieb, eh? Yeah, much like they lanced the boils on his back, uh, he has been lanced from this game. There might be a representative of that particular injury, but I feel like that is definitely the most common injury is like, you get this cut, 
the cut looks nasty and might get infected. We're pulling you from the game. There's only so so many times we can talk about that without feeling yeah. road. So I winnowed the list down to 12. And in honor of our most recent boot, I randomized the matchups. And so this is not going to be any sort of seeding. We might have two heavy hitters up against each other, but let's move forward here. Let's see. And let us I'm intrigued to see what each of our criteria is about this as well. To Kevin's point, like, are we going for iconic? Are we going for funny? Are we going for legendary? And what does those words contain? Let's start with our first matchup. We have someone who was actually mentioned, not in Survivor 46, you know, explicitly, but in the preseason press, Shamar from Survivor Karamoan got a grain of sand in his eye. And because Shamar was kind of like, uh, and Kevin's like almost unconsciously reaching for his eye at the time that I mentioned Oh my that. gosh. <laughs> um, That's why I did that. Your phantom <laughs> grain of sand in the eye. Yeah. But uh, in the moment, everyone's like, he's faking it. Uh, maybe perhaps the version of what I think you should do with an injury in the early merge. But it turns out that they had feared he had scratched his cornea, pulled him from the game in the pre-merge of Survivor Karamoan versus Beast Mode Cowboy putting his body on the line for salt and pepper. As Cindy Gillen said, infamously, this is Koro. I'm going to need no more heat, baby. And Caleb is the first indicator of that. His body experienced extreme heat stroke. He nearly died on the course. So Liana, between the two, two veterans in their own right, who is going to get the medal of honor here? The purple heart, if you will. You know, obviously I, I know, I don't know how to make these decisions. Like, like obviously, like I know it's happening, and we need criteria. But now that I have an example and I have to make a decision, I genuinely don't know. Because my first reaction was like, "Oh well, I stuff. You never want to mess with I stuff. Like that's you know, don't like that." And I was like, "But Caleb like almost died. So is that better or is that worse? Like, do I want to move Caleb on because that was probably like one of the scariest like survivor moments, or?" Does that mean, do I want to keep the silly moments? I genuinely don't know. I'm so I'm so conflicted in this moment. All right, Kevin, do you have a more concrete answer here? Yeah, I'm, I'm not conflicted here. And oh. my my criteria is going to change for every matchup, but I'll, I'll speak it. So Shamar, Shamar leaving the game, uh, he was a big character in early Karaboan, and it felt like there there was some impact, but he got he got sand in his eye and scratched his cornea. Caleb is on the ground. It is horrific to watch. Like it reminds you that this is real and scary and intense. No brainer, Caleb. This is one of those moments that's not funny at all. It's horrific to yeah. watch. And for that reason, I'm moving Caleb on. Uh correction, Kevin. It's more no beautier, because he was on the beauty tribe, not the brains tribe. <laughs> no uh, uh, yeah, I will uh, agree as well. Uh, I, I think that, listen, maybe it's just the big brother connection. Maybe Kevin's stumping for his fellow former house guest. But like, this is something that will get Caleb invited back as a quote unquote game changer. Shamar was not invited uh, back as a game changer because he hurt his eye. Uh, even though, again, I love the Tim shout out that he gives. We're still not sure whether or not it connects back to the own eye injuries that he accumulated. I will give Shamar this. It is one of the more unique medevacs that we had obviously we had like jessica lewis had some eye issues when a bunch of sand got blown into her face during the cyclone that they experienced but like i kind of did like again i forgot about this because i i tend to want to forget about survivor caramel and in general but like how that sort of fit into shamar's character where shamar was kind of like one of the pariahs the pepper rise of the tribe because like he was somebody who would always have some sort of excuse for not doing stuff and now he's like oh i got a greatest sand in my eye and everyone's like Sure you are. And he kind of became the boy who cried wolf in a way. And that like, okay, actually this time it was dangerous, but no, it's got to be Beast Mode Cowboy wow. for me. Uh, I, I love me some Korog and I got to shout it out here. Mike, this is a terrible taste. Let's continue. <laughs> <laughs> Liana, I know that you- uh, It you doesn't matter. To... I don't want to pick. <laughs> I'm regretting okaying this idea. You're picking the white rock? <laughs> Yeah, See, I will also say, I asked these this people this before this, I said, is this okay? Do you want to do this? I have a pun prepared. <laughs> I should have said I want to talk about Bonnie's sweater. <laughs> then you'll live with that decision for the rest of your life, Liana. All right, so Caleb is going to move on. Next up, Colton Cumbie 
medevaced from Survivor One World with appendicitis, even though Jeff Probst will claim later on that he quit, <laughs> which is more so that I think his body quit on him, versus Russell Swan, who had talk about yet another big incident. He was putting his body on the line for his tribe. During a challenge, it just gives up on him. His blood pressure drops in the moment. This is, uh, up until Kayla, probably the closest we've seen to somebody expire right there. And he is taken out, though he will eventually return. Liana, do you have a better finger on the pulse of this one? I, I think if we're going based on iconicness, I think Russell's is probably more iconic to me. Although as someone who has had appendicitis and had their appendix removed, it is absolutely no joke. But I think in terms of the survivor story, the survivor experience and all of that, I think I will go with Russell here. What about you, Kevin? And, and Colton did have appendicitis? He did have appendicitis. He did, Jeff. Which, just... which did make... It's interesting because we talked about how they kind of minimized the severity of Randon's injury. Due to Kat Ederson, they kind of maximized Colton's injury. If you remember, Jeff brings him all to travel council and says he has appendicitis. And Kat's like, <gasps> and thought it was some sort of fatal diagnosis. So there was a second where at least one person on that tribe believed that he had died. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm I'm gonna it's 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 an iffy one for me, and I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna go with Russell Swan for the reason that that it becomes sometimes you forget that that Philippines had the three returning uh, medevacs because you know there are so many cool characters and and fun gameplay in that season, but it's the fact that it influenced that season and, and he was the first medically evacuated one out afterwards. I think it's interesting. He plays such a key role in that thing. So let's go with Russell Swan. Yeah, this was a tough matchup. The randomizer did not do us any favors because I actually do like that from a story perspective, this actually works for both of them where Russell Swan was voted the leader on day one of Samoa and worked his ass off there's a scene in the episode where he gets medevac where he is like out in the pouring rain while everyone's huddled in the shelter like insisting that he works nobody's asking him to this is like a role that he took upon himself and it leads to him working himself to the point of exhaustion and dehydration colton meanwhile is like the king of one world at this point you want to talk about like actual mm -hmm. villains this is a guy who was somehow orchestrating everything had an idol in his pocket, was on his way to the merge. And then, like, of all people, Christina Shaw, who he was, like, offensively making fun of, is the one to find him curled up in the middle of the jungle, like, uh, just on death's door, essentially, needing to be emergency medevac. It was kind of, like, an interesting moment of, I don't want to say karma, but, like, how the mighty have fallen to watch this guy get so unceremoniously taken out after being in such a high position in the game. So I might have actually nudged Colton above Russell Swan for that reason, but like, I can't deny Russell Swan, uh, an incredibly harrowing moment. He does recover and survive. And I do also love, maybe it helps that in Philippines, he comes back and does basically the exact same thing and ends up suffering because of that. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on here to uh, our golden oldies side of things in this matchup listen not to say anything about the activities of these people that get medevac they make full recoveries we don't speak about what happens after that oh no the original medevac himself michael scoopin <laughs> taking on going back to survivor co wrong the third and final medevac from that season joe del campo who if you might <laughs> not <laughs> remember <laughs> won a reward challenge at the final five. It was a feast of meat. He gorged on it. And as a result, got like a urinary infection where he couldn't go to the bathroom. And as a result, had to get pulled from the game. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if you were going to include Scoopin in this. Um, I, was I mean, I, very... I couldn't not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the Joe Del Campo one is so funny. Like, I know, I know, again, it's horrible, but like Puya and I will quote like, oh, but the meat was so tender, like to each other a lot. So <laughs> uh, this is like a, <laughs> this is just where it falls in my heart. I can use whatever criteria I want. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go with Joe Del Campo, even though I'm happy if I'm overruled. All right, Kevin, what do you got? Yeah, this is a tough one because the, the scoop and medevac is 
one of the cultural zeitgeist moments of Survivor, where, I mean, it was all over the news, it was in the media everywhere. Uh, I mean, I wasn't even born yet at the time. And the, and oh, like, it- Weird flex, but okay. It was- <laughs> Oh my God. Oh, my bones, um, they're crumbling. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so intense. And I think like, I mean, I, I remember watching it and, and feeling horrified at home as, as, you know, a child and like, but I, I Joe Del Com, Joe Del Camp is maybe I, I don't want to spoil it because I had a voting Joe. It is unbelievable. <laughs> it is so funny. Yes! It is humorous. Uh, it is this. How can you not find the the humor in it? It's ridiculous. It's like another. Is it like in, it's like close to the end of the game? It's another barrier that, that it's, it's that, the penultimate <laughs> episode, and Joe Del Campo gets medevac yeah. just because, and it's not because of like a kneel, right? Like, oh, there's this lingering in injury that finally comes to manifest. Mm -hmm. It's like he happens to win this reward challenge where he overindulges, and then he becomes sort of incontinent as a result. There's there's a, there's like a hubris to it. It's another thing for for Aubrey to face. Another like it's it, there's so much going on. Plus, Korong has has three medevacs which is ridiculous yeah. and that can make a season bad but in this case it actually makes things interesting and i i mean i'm 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 team team tender joe wow look at this so scoopin is uh put in time out i should say barred from entering the next round i'm a little surprised by just because again i mean it's it's such an incredibly iconic scene iconic moment we talk about the fourth wall breaking down there was just really the first time they did that, I know it was what, like the 19th episode of the show overall, but like mm -hmm. to see Nick turn to the camera and be like, oh yeah, he's burned pretty bad, Terry, to have like everybody swoop in. It was one of those moments where for so many people that were accusing the show of like, oh, it's all staged. They're on the CBS Radford lot. Like they're not actually starving. This was one of those moments where people got shut up about that. They're like, oh crap. Oh yeah, that's his skin. Oh, he fell into the fire. And listen, there's much more humor, I think, to be mined out of, like, old man can't pee. But at the same time, I think there's a little bit of humor to be mined out of, like, at the moment, this is the most garish, horrific injury that can happen to somebody. And then to find out what happened to Michael Scoopin afterwards, you kind of look at the fire as the hero of the story. Like, <laughs> there's a little bit of comedy to mine out of that. <laughs> yeah we should have been team fire all along <laughs> yeah when sue hawk said like we should do as what mother nature intended i think that's what the fire did in that moment oh. well we go from a guy who jumped into the water uh he loses to the man who couldn't make water joe del campo with the upset moves on here let's move to our second half of first round matchups let's it's a crazy activity <laughs> isn't it just Let's move to the only woman medevaced in Survivor history. Mm. We may not remember this. Courtney mm. Moon. Kevin is pounding his chest like Matthew McConaughey in the Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a wild one. The first challenge of Survivor One World begins mm. with them jumping 25 feet down into a cargo net. They were told... Keep your hands over your chest. Kind of like what Kevin was doing in that moment. Courtney Moon, with her quirky whale hats, decides she's going to break conventions. She's a rule breaker. She's a rebel. And as a result, whether just due out of pure fear or perhaps forgetfulness in the moment, puts her wrist down to brace her fall and ends up in a brace. As she breaks her wrist, she tries to make it through the challenge. They have to stop it and basically be like, oh, okay, I guess since the men were further along, they win. I suppose, but it's all sort of ceremonious, all for naught, as Courtney is medevaced. Uh, for a while, she will be the earliest medevaced from the game as she is pulled with a broken wrist versus James Clement, uh, someone from Survivor mm -hmm. Micronesia, who is one of those typical, typical, oh, I got I got a cut and I'm getting medevaced for, for it. But it was on his finger. It was from him working too hard. And I do think there's a little bit of fun irony in if you remember earlier in Micronesia, Eliza was feeling sick, and he's the one that specifically is like, you know what? You should medevac her. Wouldn't that be funny? And again, karma tends to come back around in some oh. of these instances. Mm. This is tough. This is a tough matchup. It's interesting because, like, obviously, two, like, a first boot from one world, and then, like, James Clement, who's, like, yeah. arguably one of the biggest characters in Survivor. But at the same time, I remember both of these, like, very clearly. I don't know why. 
Um, so that, that makes it very tough for me to make a decision. I'm curious, Kevin, if you have a gut feeling. <laughs> so for Courtney Moon, I actually just find it sad. I, I, I don't find it funny. Aww. I just find it sad. It's the first episode. It's also part of what makes one of the weak points of one world is the multi, in this case, the multiple medevacs. James, it's sad, but there's a little, there's a little humor in there. Like this is after he's been, uh, after he left China with two idols in his pocket, two giant square idols. And there is an element of, oh no, I can't believe it happened to the hero again. For me, I think because of the the better story arc, it's going to be James. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say female empowerment. I was going to say <laughs> Liana. <laughs> I gotta support the one woman who's got many back. Survivor, Even if it was one woman. Really stupid reasons and is uh, is quite sad. I agree with Kevin on that one. And uh, we'll make Mike break the tie. Oh, Lord. Well, this is a tough one because there's also such interesting tales to this story. Courtney, for those that might not remember, so she ends up getting medevac, but I remember this clear as day, maybe even more so than the medevac proper. When she did her exit interview with Rob, do you remember she revealed that? When it's a good thing she broke her wrist because when she went to the doctor, the doctor found out that she had cancer. Oh, yep. yeah. So, like, absolutely wild set of circumstances oh. of, like, talk about the dominoes. If Cordy had followed proper net protocol, things could have gone in a very dark direction for her life. So I guess, thank God, she stuck her wrist out. On the other hand... James, it's not even about the karma from the medevac, even though that is funny to me. And the reason why I actually kind of stuck this into the bracket is the image of James at that tribal council where he walks in with an IV connected to his yes. finger. Like he just oh got busted out of the ICU to attend tribal council. That image is something that will stick with me of like, he could have just pulled a Pascal and skipped out at that night's tribal council. I don't know if he needed, to, as much as he loved Amanda, I don't know if he needed to be there for her idol play. You couldn't have needed to get James out of bed and have him walk out with a full IV stand on wheels, squeaking along, making bed sounds as, as it's connected to his finger. So I think I'm going to put my finger on James here and give it to him. <sighs> yeah, fair. It's, it, it, it is interesting, the, the ratio of of men to women that have act. Yeah, I don't know what it is. It's, it's sort of like almost the opposite of how idols were skewing in the first portion of Survivor, right? Where it's like, well, the men are out hunting more. And so maybe they're putting their bodies on the line more in these extremely physical challenges. And even the one woman who got medevaced, it was a complete freak circumstance, right? It was in the middle of a challenge. It's not like, oh my God, I cut my hand open mm. with the machete. <laughs> Well, aren't more males born than females Stupid. like every year? <laughs> like, like the oh. ratio is like there's more men than women born. And I heard one explanation for that is because to even out the population because men are stupid so <laughs> that's why oh, they'll okay. injure their, themselves well, more I'm looking, at, I'm looking at pew pew research center says in 2021 the global sex ratio at birth was 106 male births per 100 female births yeah yeah, more. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I don't think that, that that's actually true, that men are stupid. And so they end up dying. So you need more and originally like more. No, you already born, said but... female empowerment, Leon. I can't put that toothpaste back in the tube. Ready, ready, ready. <laughs> Y'all are dumb. <laughs> you inspired me to do a little search. Also, the Darwin Awards, which are awarded to the stupidest mm -hmm. deaths. Yes. 88.7%. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> there we go. Darwin so male. Hashtag. Uh, all right. Well, let's move on here. And look, we talk about Survivor Fate being poetic. We've got a stanza right here for you. Bruce v. Bruce. We've got cool. uh, Bruce Kanagai from Survivor Panama. The second ever medevac in Survivor history. Ten seasons after Scoopin, who... Look constipation i would not wish that upon my worst enemy it is excruciatingly painful but also he couldn't poop versus the more one of the more recent medevacs bruce peralt who ha which happened seconds into the game bruce ends up becoming someone with the shortest tenure in survivor history only last 12 hours in the game and as we talked about with someone like Russell, perhaps with someone like Scoopin, does have a sequel to the story. Liana, does that skew this in one direction for you? 
I think the fat, so I love Panama. It's one of my, if not my favorite season of Survivor. So I think that that's immediately where my vote has to go, especially the fact that they got Casa de Charmin. Like that in and of itself with the combination of the fact that Bruce couldn't poop and that's why he got Medivac. Like uh, that, I would, I have to go with that. That's what my gut is telling me. Oh, well, Bruce should have listened to his gut as well. That was the problem. That's what I'm saying. This one's really hard for me. This one's really as hard. As was for me. the poops that Bruce was trying to make. And it's less it's less about Panama Bruce and more about everything going on around him. Like right. I don't know, like Shane's just shading at, at, at the time. And I think I'm going with the criteria of the multi-season arcs because I do love hmm. first of all, a head injury is is nothing to laugh at. And mm. you Mike, you were saying earlier how some people were, were up up in arms about Bruce getting medically evacuated. Your brain is the most important thing he had absolutely needed to happen. And the fact mm. that he came back and was to me one of my favorite characters of that season is awesome. Because I found Bruce unbelievably entertaining. So I'm going mm. for the multi-season arc here. Okay. So I will break the tie here in the battle of the Bruce's. Oh, man, I am between a rock and a hard stone here. Because, yeah, the Bruce Peralt story is so much fun of dying a hero or living long enough to see yourself become mm. the villain to the point where, listen, it was a little out of pocket, but people were like, did Bruce change after that injury? Like, was this the guy that was going to be playing on 44 just because of the absolute lovable nonsense that that man was bringing to the beach from the get-go. And I agree, Kevin, one of the standout characters from season 44, Bruce Kanagai's evacuation is one of my favorite episodes in Survivor history. It is certainly the funniest. I mean, look, I gotta go with branding here. Even though we say Brandons don't do well, branding does have to. And I'd be remiss not to put forward somebody who is pulled from the show because he can't poop. Like, come on. It's so silly. I'm so sorry. Like, it's, but poop is silly. <laughs> poop is funny. <laughs> it's a thing that everyone does, but poop is funny. It's objectively hilarious. And the fact that he got pulled because he couldn't poop of all things, it sucks. And I'm sure it happens more often than not because they're so nutritionally, you know, deprived out there. Mm -hmm. But Bruce couldn't poop. And so I got to give it to the original Bruce over the newer Bruce. And, and for everybody listening, what is the optimal strategy if you go to a reward or you get to eat not your regular survivor nutritional meal? Because it seems like this has been a problem for multiple people. How do you avoid? Yeah. Right. Because Bruce had said that he couldn't poop since they went to this big Panamanian village. village and they yeah. had this feast. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it like, should you, because then I'm thinking with Joe Del Campos, his was meat heavy. Is it like something about the types of food that you're eating? Like you need to make sure you eat a ton of fiber, like oh. a bunch of veggies, you know, before you dig into anything else. Well, I think what you do is you try to find the most natural laxatives that exist within uh, whatever you're being given smart. right and what i do find interesting is that what doesn't help is that they've stopped doing like the coffee and cafe rewards in the new era i think if i were somebody you go to mm -hmm. that cafe and you like squirrel away as much you fill your canteen with iced coffee for the rest of the game so if you're ever feeling mm -hmm. not regular you just down a little bit of that iced coffee will help with your verb will help with your energy even though that didn't help someone like cody for instance but at the same time could also really help if you're having some digestional trouble hmm. okay avoid dairy is another thing that you should do i think so like maybe not the cheese if there's any type of cheese doesn't that help you go to the bathroom well no well, uh, if, you're, maybe well if, you're, if you're lactose intolerant maybe Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess it depends. Uh, really, just like you want to focus on a lot of foods that contain a lot of fiber seems okay. to be the the go to, you know, your prunes, um, <laughs> leafy greens, things like that. Jeff, I'm here to negotiate. Uh, I'll give away our rice if we can have prunes for the rest of the season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Our final matchup in this first round, it is going to be our most recent medevac in Randon, unfortunately suffering a sudden yet kind of invisible injury of uh, having some nerve damage on day seven versus Jonathan Penner. Yet another instance again of like, mm. oh no, I got this cut and it got infected. But one of the most iconic versions, I would say, I believe it, it was poked by a pointy stick and that's kind of minimizing the state of things in one of the challenges. 
He has this like tear jerking medevac and he does come back as well. So I wanted to include all three Philippines returnees just because mm-hmm. of how iconic they were. Liana, any thoughts about this final first round matchup? Yeah, I think my initial gut is telling me to go with Penner. I think that just, I don't know, like obviously whatever, what's the opposite of recency bias? That's what I'm feeling. Nostalgia. Like, I don't wanna... Yeah, nostalgia. So I'm feeling a little bit nostalgic <laughs> for Penner's medical evacuation. But I think like the multi-season arc, I think the Philippines motivation, like all of that, I think I have to go with that as my reasoning. And Brandon, just like, I don't know, I just feel really bad for him. It just happened. So I still kind of feel real bad. Whereas like Penner's at this point, I don't really feel so bad no more because, you know, like he got to come back and play again. All right, Kevin, what about you? Same here. Multi-season arc. Penner comes back. It's also a little bit more dramatic of at least in on TV of, of an injury. Um, and also like, I don't, I don't see, I don't see any humor in, in Randon right, right now, mm-hmm. you know, like it's, yeah. it's sad. It's recent. Listen, if Randon gets the Bruce spot and comes back, maybe we'll come back to this bracket though. We, I don't think ever would, uh, with villain Brandon. Randon. Yeah, exactly. Like a villain decide if Brandon yeah. decides to just say like, well, I've got this second chance now that I've got my grip back, I'm gripping this game by the horns then that'd be absolutely lovely. But I do think Penner, it was sort of like this odd meat in the sandwich, right? Where he like plays infamously in Cook Islands, gets this random medevac and then comes back in Philippines and is able to play a quote unquote normal game and finish in the exact same spot he got in in Cook Islands. It's a bit of an odd sort of arc for him. Uh, So he will move on here. Let's move on to our second round. Now here's a question. We're going to have two three person matchups. Would you rather decide one winner from each or would you rather cut off like the last place finisher and then have 2v2 and then 1v1? Should this be semifinals or quarterfinals is what I'm asking. Well, they're going to end up going. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay, perfect. So we're going to determine one top finisher. It's like those Redemption Island duels back in the day. What if we have a 1v1 v1 vote? Oh, okay. Come through, traitors. Yeah. Yeah. Let's keep re-voting. Okay. Uh, all okay. right, so our first matchup here is going to be Caleb Reynolds versus mm-hmm. Russell Swan versus mm-hmm. Joe Del Campo. So That's we got two tough. two season players versus a man who couldn't pee. Liana, this is like okay. the balance of like iconicness I- and uh, longevity versus humor. So here's the thing: I'm never gonna pick Caleb. So like, if you two are gonna okay, pick Amber. Caleb then fine. Or like if one of you would pick Caleb, I would end up siding with the other. Okay. So I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there now. So I think you two make your picks and you decide, and then I will either break the tie or just be left (laughs) in the die. Ever written like four out of the pad, three out of the four pads. I don't care. Just hits the ball back. I'm not picking Caleb. I will pick one of the other two, but I will not pick Caleb. What? What's the reason? Uh, because his is just really sad to me. Like I just, it's uh-huh. scary and it's sad and I see no humor in it and I see no joy in it. And uh, to me, it's just like, I understand he came back for game changers, but I don't know. To me, it just doesn't, it doesn't do it for me. So I would always pick one of the other two. All right. So I wouldn't say Ke- uh, Kevin Liana forced your hand. I think she more so was like nudging the hand in a certain direction. Are you resisting or are you going but in that you direction? You two can pick, like you two could pick Caleb and that's fine. Mm-hmm. Like just to be clear. But what I'm saying is, is that it's to, to avoid a one, one, one in this situation. <laughs> like I will never be picking Caleb. So if one of you picks Caleb and the other one picks one of the other two, that's the one I will go with. It's a very interesting approach, but I think, I think you've, uh, I'm getting real like Maria vibes. I love it. I I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll go full Jelinski here and I'll, I'll cave. I will not, I will not pick Caleb. I do think it's one of the most for sure iconic ones. Um, but, but yeah, yeah, I mean, let's, let's, so in that case, considering that that russell swan is a bit also like it's it's not it's not a fun you know there's nothing fun about it what is fun is joe del campo eating too much meat so i mean listen i'm gonna stick with tender joe listen i i don't want to be so forward and i don't want to put opinions in your heads can we have our final bp versus poop (laughs) oh my gosh oh mike classic mike bloom but well, see, like here's the thing so 
that's the thing. Like, I think if you are picking, like, the most shocking, the, like, the winner of the bracket to me is either Caleb or it's one of the funny ones. Yeah. Right. So to me, it's Joe Duckett. So for me, it's like, what what do I want to honor here? Like, if Caleb won the bracket, that makes sense. Because that yeah. I agree with Kevin. Like, that's the most harrowing. Like, that's terrifying. The helicopters. Like, the mm -hmm. fact that the whole promo is all about that. You know it's coming. Like, it, and the fact that it was for salt and pepper or whatever they were playing, spices. Like and he that, did push it. Ah. Uh -huh. And the fact that they win, like all of that is so iconic and so amazing. I just, I, the what the struggle that I have is just, it's just so, like, it's just, it's scary. Like it's, mm -hmm. it, it is yeah. actually scary to me. And that, I, I don't know, that was scarier than Russell's. Russell's was pretty scary, but Caleb's is more scary. So if the criteria is if we're going with that, then that I understand. And we've cut <laughs> scoop in already, which is, is, also, also incredibly horrible. Arguably very scary. Yes. Yes. I'll float it out there again. <laughs> oh, you're going to float it out there? <laughs> For the floaters. I mean, <laughs> pee versus poop final two? <laughs> what are the other three on the other side? Uh, the it's, it's actually, it's Bruce sandwich between James and Penner, the two Micronesia medevacs. My argument would be that James and Penner are known for much more than the injuries that they both mm. ended up happening in their middle season. I would say James's knee injury in Heroes versus Villains, even though that wasn't a medevac, is more iconic than his mm. finger medevac. I don't know. Now maybe I'm reconsidering my strong arm situation. Oh, okay. Because now I'm like, what? What really do I want to represent the winner of the bracket? <laughs> Do I want it to be the thing that makes me the most sad? But then it feels weird to have pee or poop win. You know what I mean? Like that's the joke. That's the joke answer. Like in my heart of hearts, can I be okay? We're the with that? joke podcast. I don't know, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think Liana's on the floor. <laughs> you broke me. Uh, Who would have thought this was the thing that would break me? Liana's going to medevac from this podcast. I know. I'm going to medevac from this podcast. That's okay. I've got several Jeff probes with me. We'll be okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, Kevin. What do you think about, like, what represents the winner of the bracket? Like, you what know, do you think about the pee poop final two? Like, that just feels so, like, light. Like, oh, you're making light of the medevacs. Let me let I me go back know. to the beginning of this podcast. We have three masterminds <laughs> in the room. I think the only <laughs> right thing is to end with P versus Pooh. <laughs> and listen, we are manifesting, in my opinion, a theme. Jeff, I know several of you are listening. You're welcome. I think you could do a season P mm -hmm. versus Pooh. You know what I color the tribe should be. Exactly. <laughs> Not the yellow brown tribes. <laughs> oh man! All right, the, so, the rewards could be asparagus, yeah, um, asparagus. soluble fiber. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you could get like winning. Benefiber to sponsor it. Yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis is out there being like, "Hey, everybody!" <laughs> I should just walk it out like Johnny Fairplay. <laughs> yeah, there could be a know. reward where Bruce, where Bruce and Joe are just waiting on a boat, yeah, and they'll like talk to you. I'll give you some advice. <laughs> Don't do what I did. <laughs> Here's some prebiotic yogurt. <laughs> like, <laughs> listen, I'm all, all right, okay. I'm, I'm all for Jamie that. Fair poop to come out and as a player to be like, uh, "Listen, I'm an expert here." <laughs> All okay, right. so let's let's say we push forward the pee and poop into the final two. Now that's the real debate. Boston and diarob. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> yeah, so now I guess if it's official, we're putting a rubber stamp on it. We have Joe Del Campo can't pee versus Bruce Kanagai can't poop. <laughs> oh man. The irony of the Casa de Charmin really mm. makes me want to go with with Bruce on this one. But the Joe Del Campo medivac was also like peak camp. And the fact that Del it Campo. almost theoretically, like potentially like caused Aubrey to lose the game as mm -hmm. well. Like that's another thing to consider that that had such a potentially major impact on the ultimate winner of the season, which also is very interesting to me. Um, I think, I, I think, I think, 
I think I'm team poop. <laughs> I hate that I said that. Yes. All right, Liana, uh, locking it in for Bruce. Kevin, what do you got? For Joe. You going yeah. for Joe? Yeah. yeah. So, oh. no, but no, I was saying Liana. So, so, so Koran is a season of Medivacs. Mm. Um, yes. Caleb ah. goes. Uh, Neil, who we mentioned earlier, goes. Something, something That's actually a good account. point because then it kind of represents both. And the seriousness of Caleb's medivac. <laughs> no, no, you can't be like Caleb lives on in the form of Joe Del Campo. <laughs> he does. In some ways, he does, and even I think in in that same challenge, Sydney and Debbie collapse. Like it's just like a mm -hmm. a very yeah. hot day in Cambodia, and I just think it's only right that Joe represent this bracket because he is representing the whole season it's funny it's not too dark it's just a dude who couldn't go to the bathroom because he <laughs> ate too much tender meat and i i like i like leaving with that because there is a fine balance here with like mm -hmm. some of this stuff is pretty dark it's people's yeah. dreams being snatched from them yeah. and jeff telling them they have to leave this is a guy who wasn't gonna win anyway and he's at the end game and too much beef he's had too much beef so i'm going i'm going to Wait, you're going pee or poo? Because you just did this whole monologue. Sorry, I'm going pee. I'm going I was pee. Gonna say, like, and I'm all that pee. being said, that's why I'm going, I'm going with poo. Pee. I'm going pee. I'm going pee. <laughs> Liana, are you? Shoot. Wait, Mike, you're going Bruce. I got to go Bruce. Yeah. I got I to gotta go, much like he did. So I'm going to put this back Shoot. on you. You have been yeah. deflecting this whole time, Liana. It comes <laughs> back around to you. Pee or poo? Uh, final answer. This is why Kevin won Big Brother. I'm siding with Kevin. I think that that's a strong argument. I think that I can, it's a compromise for me to like the, it, it wrong representing this also like that feels right. Like three medivacs, three medivacs. That's wild. I'm, I'm going, okay. I switched teams. I'm team P. All right. So congratulations to Joe Del Campo. <laughs> For winning the medevac, it uh, I would not have expected this. Certainly, uh, the upset of him over he who must not be named in the first round already took me out. Uh, but he uh. ended up being the Cinderella story to get all the way to the end, even though he did an on wrong. Congratulations to him and his. <laughs> and as celebration, here's a giant tray of meat for all to enjoy. Something to be proud of. Well, thank you all for enduring that, both the people participating as well as the ones that are listening. Listen, it was odd and it was dark, but I feel like it's perfectly toned for this season as well, right? And so uh, people can take it one way or the other, but regardless, we do have a winner from the Medivac it, and we can move on to also perhaps shining a light in the darkness as we do every week here on the BNB. Our guest gets to put forward a charity or cause that is important to them. Kevin, the ball is once again in your court. What would you like to highlight? Oh my gosh, I completely forgot about this section. You know what? Um, I don't. I have a I have a Canadian one. But I don't okay, that's a, fine. We can find okay. an American version shortly if you want to talk about what it's about. Um, okay. Well, I just I just started uh, about a month ago. I went to uh, this event called Motion Ball in toronto i didn't know what it was i got invited and i was like cool i'd heard about it for years it's for uh special olympics canada and uh now i'm like super interested in it and i got to meet some of the athletes and it was like an unbelievable night and i thought it would be like a I, I it was like a gala and you hear gala i'm like oh it was so much fun so let me let me say Special Olympics Canada or special I don't know I don't know what the organizations are in the U.S. but this is this is a new a new thing that 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 I'm into and uh, Motion Ball they do it they do a marathon of sport day where you get to go and like uh, play sports with the athletes and it's all in good fun and everybody's nice and it's like the friendliest group of people ever so that is my off the cuff totally forgot that this happens no, but yeah, uh, no you you recovered. Sense admirably and yeah there is uh you can go to specialolympics.org to donate as well i think actually it's like i think localized donations on the special olympics mm -hmm. website so it's a good cause to uh to give attention to i think especially in a year of the olympics mm -hmm. love that all right kevin 
fantastic work as per usual. We waited through a very odd episode, a very odd game, and we emerged all the very much odder. Thank you, as always, for bringing your full self into this. What would you like to plug, particularly for the listeners out there? Uh, I got a, I got a newsletter. I'm writing about Survivor once a week right now. This week will go out in the next couple days. It is about uh, if they did go to tribal council, would it be right for mm. Q and Tiff to get rid of Banu or Kenzie? And you can find it in my pinned tweet at Kevin Ted Jacobs. That's where you can find the newsletter. Nice. Uh, and I know you hopped onto the premiere of Big Brother Canada, I believe, a couple of weeks yeah. ago. For those that are not tuned in, uh, do you give it a thumbs up? Would you recommend it? What's been your take on the season so far? <laughs> It's, I think it's similar to 46 in that it's a little... You know, what are you laughing about, Liana? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> my, my, take, Go ahead. My, my take is the following. It's a little bit early to judge. They have two returnees, um, Anthony and, and Spicy V, and it's been quite interesting to watch them have a pretty solid first couple of weeks. I'm interested to see how things play out because there are some big, freaky personalities outside of them in the house and i'll also say that if you're still complaining about no feeds a year and a bit later I, like i i get it but like get over it okay get over it if you want to watch it it's very well produced tv like it's fun to watch that is that is my my quick take stop stop complaining you don't have to watch if you don't want to but it's good and the digital do. dailies are like bet are better like they actually contain real content this year i haven't watched any of them but that's what i've heard so there's we're a actually big like fight. Getting in oh yeah there's a yeah. big fight in a car right yeah uh, Sp yes. spicy v won one hoh and just for her own entertainment she just got she just went to two different sides and told them about each other and and it, they just they just ended up fighting with each other and she's just sitting there laughing Oh my god. I'm intrigued actually and this is probably going to be so much apples and oranges but is no fee for Big Brother Canada the same as like 26 days to US Survivor in terms of like people using it as a point of consternation? I, I think that's a very good argument. I think there's absolutely I, something there. I think there's more wait okay. Uh, I think more people Okay, I don't know if more people were upset, but I do, my gut feeling is, I think there's more reason to be upset and more people were upset with not getting live feeds Yes. than 26 days. However, at this point, I do agree with Kevin. Like, look, this is where we're at. Let's enjoy what we have. Yeah, that's what drew the comparison to me is I think that sort of is like kind of the reality we've all settled into the new era. I think Rob espouses it very perfectly of like, Listen, is it my ideal Survivor format? No, but it's not going away, so let's sort of get used to it. And I think there is sort of that level of acceptance to it that I think Kevin is sort of encouraging happens with Big Brother Canada as well. If people feel like there's a, a different sort of version of it, feel free to sound off, but not too much. Again, we're not going to spend the entire podcast complaining about things because we're too stupid and like to vote pee over poo in the finals of our brackets. Liana, what would you like to plug? Yes, so let's see. Um, Mass Singer is going on. Puya and I are doing Mass Singer. Drag Race is going on. So that's a thing. Um, I talked about Survivor AU, which was very, very fun. Uh, there's a new episode out, and I'm very nervous to watch that. Um, so, yeah, that's what's going on with me. Uh, and of course, you can follow Liana at Leon RHAP, and you can follow me at a Mike Bloom type. I mentioned it before my interview with Randon. Very informative. Not only does he give the actual timeline for the recovery from his injury instead of just next day, hey, I'm okay. He also talks about, again, the weird, tricky circumstances around like he wanted to give Venus his beware advantage. He tried to get up and go to his jacket. Okay, it's always about the jackets with this survivor exit drama. Uh, he talks some more about like what would have happened had they gone to tribal council and he stayed. So really great interview with Randon. And then, of course, the amazing race has returned. I had a really fun 90-minute premiere and a very fun podcast as well. Um, I would say probably slightly frightening for some people, but you know what? A little fear will do a body good. And so I encourage people to check out the video of that one in particular as we break down the 90-minute debut of 13 teams and also a special announcement that this season with Amazing Race podcast is going to be myself, 
Jessica Lee, and we're going to try to bring in alumni, uh, if not every episode, as much as we can. And so uh, Rob will be taking a bit of a backseat in this taxi cab as we are going to be moving forward, unfortunately without him, but I think bringing on some really fun alumni in the process. Speaking of guests, a little TBD on our guests for next week's b and We'll try to have that locked down, obviously, before the episode airs on Wednesday, which should continue to be interesting for 46. Again, this episode was very oddly structured, perhaps partially due to the outcome. So hopefully, if we get an actual vote next episode, we shall see what's going to happen. It looks like Banu is going to continue to step in it, perhaps, uh, as much as we're talking about him having to turn around from this dead end at a point, he might be able to plow through the dead end, surprisingly. And so we'll see exactly what happens with all of these wild people by episode four's end. And Liana and I will come back next weekend to break it all down. Thank you all so much for listening. If you have games you want to send us so we don't have to do wildly, humorously dark ideas like a metavac, of course, reach out to us, rhapbnb at gmail.com or hashtag rhapbnb on social media. And of course, we are grateful for any and all support we have received this season. Special thanks to the entire team behind the scenes at RHAP for getting this podcast to your eyes and ears, and to Will from America for his fantastic theme song. Leon and I will be back with guest TBD to break down episode four of Survivor 46. Until next time, we'll check you out at your next stay.